recorded. Um, welcome everybody to this talk of how to talk about race and racism with your child, really geared towards supporting your child's racial literacy development. Um, my name is Melina Madrigal. I'm an educator and a DEI specialist at La Scuola. Let us begin. Okay. All right. So I wanted to start. Everyone can see my screen okay? Yeah? Perfect. Okay, great. All right. So I just want to start with doing, um, for our tonight's objectives, we're going to do a little self-assessment um, and speak a little bit about the challenges of speaking about race and racism, and then look at just some common, uh, establishing some common understanding and, and race basics, and then move into uh, a developmental approach, as well as some you know, proactive anti-racism tips and strategies and, and, and whatnot. So a quick check-in. Where, where you're at in your comfort level about talking about race and racism. So go ahead and just read, you know, would you rather not talk about it? Are you very uncomfortable, usually uncomfortable, um, very comfortable? You know, where do you fall on this, on this spectrum? And, and if you're open to it, you know, try to up the challenge here in, in ending the sentence, you know, with people of my own race or with people of other races. Because uh, that definitely can put a big difference in, 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 in your evaluation. Okay. And this is just for you personally. No one needs to share. I just want you to check in with yourself and understand. Um, and then think about what is the hard part about talking about racism? Like, what is it that is maybe impeding you or it brings you difficulty in talking about it? Um, and then, and what is the beneficial but talk about but talk part about talking about racism. And again, if you want to go deeper with this, you can think about it in terms of with people of my own race or with people of, of other races. Okay. Okay. So this is a, a quote I want to start with uh, from Ijema Oluwa, who is the author of So You Want to Talk About Race. Racial oppression should always be an emotional topic to discuss. It should always be anger inducing. As long as racism exists to ruin the lives of countless people of color, it should be something that upsets us. But it upsets us because it exists, not because we talk about it. And if you're white and you don't want to feel any of that pain by having these conversations, then you are asking people of color to continue to bear the entire burden of racism alone. So why is it so difficult to talk about race? Let's just take a moment really to like check in with ourselves and understanding why people in our lives also have difficulty talking about it. Um, there are kind of the typical reasons of feeling that you just don't know enough, you're not informed, not really racially literate. Um, I'm gonna guess that most of us did not uh, gain any kind of racial literacy education. Um, you're being afraid to say the wrong thing is a very, very big reason why. Um, and fear of making issues more racialized if we focus on them. And specifically for white, adult, uh, white adults, there's this, you know, the issue of not seeing themselves always in racial terms, um, that race is the problem of the other. And, you know, our society obviously reinforces this. You can, you can become a CEO of a, a top 500 corporation and never have to learn about what the experience like of being a person of color. Um, you know, our, our society does not emphasize this and it doesn't emphasize um, understanding whiteness. It is, again, I'm sure you've heard the water that we all swim in. Um, and then, and this is from Robin D'Angelo's White Fragility too, when she's talking uh, about white adults um, usually have opinions that are uninformed um, as people that are not uh, or that benefit from racism, you know, there has is a strong lack of deep diving into understanding racism. So the opinions are, are not really informed the way they need to be. Um, and then people are very unaware of socialization. So sometimes uh, we see, you know, everybody likes to think, especially in a, in a place like America, of themselves as individuals, as objective. And it really just demonstrates that they are unaware of the process of socialization and how they are, are a part of that. Um, and then there's just really simplistic views of racism. You know, I'm, you know, people thinking I'm nice to everybody, no matter what they look like. Um, I am, you know, that 
you know, I have, I have a black coworker that we hang out, you know, so really simplistic views of racism and not understanding um, the taxonomy of racism, as I like to call it, that there are multiple levels of how racism is functioning in any given society. society. And, and I just want to take a moment so that we all are aware of these different levels and types. Um, so there's internalized racism, which are the race-based beliefs and feelings within individuals. Um, those are typically you know, what leads to implicit bias or bias in general, explicit. Um, and you know, it may or may not materialize, if you will. For specifically for people of color, um, it's the internalization of oppression by the racially subordinated. So for instance, Ibram X. Kendi, he writes about his racism um, when he was in high school and he participated in a Martin Luther King Jr. Day contest, an essay writing contest. And he wrote about the, the plight and the struggle of black people. And he, his message was you know, about working harder and, and trying more and, and you know, really getting ignited. And he, and he understands that he, you know, in his later years that he talks about it, he was mortified by it um, because he realized that he had been internalizing those racist messages um, that, you know, and not realizing institutional racism that was creating those inequities. So he was really blaming the victim. Um, on the interpersonal level, this is, we're referring to the bigotry and biases shown between individuals through word and action you know, saying, go back to your country, you know, to somebody who is, you know, wearing hijab and was born and raised here. So that's like an example. Uh, institutional is a discriminatory policies and practices within organizations. So a school system, for instance, that concentrates students of color in the most overcrowded, underfunded schools with the least qualified teachers. That would be an example of institutional. And systemic is the ongoing racial inequities made by society, maintained by society. So these are the disproportionate gaps in wealth, health, education, and in employment that um, amongst whites and people of color. So also having a very basic understanding, you know, in order to really talk to your children, your children um, are, are getting a wonderful education through our, our racial literacy curriculum. So it's important that you don't need to be an expert. And I don't need you to be an expert to be able to talk to your kid. These conversations about racism and race should be happening already as you're learning. Um, but having a very basic understanding of how race and racism came to be is extremely important. Um, understanding that it is a social construct and that there is no biological truth to race, that we share, all humans share 99.9% .9 of our DNA. Um, there's no race chromosome at all. Um, and there's no evidence that the groups we commonly call races have distinct unifying genetic identities. So diving a little bit deeper in how did race and racism come about? Uh, this is a book by Ibram X. Kendi, who is a, a historian at the University of Florida. And he, this is an extremely dense book, I will tell you right away, that lots, lots of facts, lots of information. It's a, um, it's a great read. And he talks about how, you know, contrary to popular conceptions, racist ideas did not arise from ignorance or hatred. Instead, they were devised and honed by some of the most brilliant minds of each era. These intellectuals use their brilliance to justify and rationalize deeply entrenched discriminatory policies and the nation's racial disparities in everything from wealth to health. So again, you know, so many people have this idea of the simplistic view of racism being, you know, hateful and bigoted people, ignorant people are, you know, perpetrating racism. Um, but having a stronger understanding of how this was developed and for whom it was developed and the, how that is still in action is really important in, in being able to have effective conversations about race and racism with your, your children. So Ken, Kendi does argue that the root of racism is economic self-interest. So it starts, you know, with the um, seeking to accrue, accumulate, and maintain power and wealth that produces discriminatory policies that then rely upon the proliferation of racist ideas to stay in place. And Kendi actually does um, highlight the you know, world's first racist, as he likes to say, um, which was Prince Henry of Portugal, and we're talking about the year 1415, uh, being very envious of the, the riches of the, the Muslim trading posts. So um, 
heading over there to conquer and capture in the meantime as well enslaved Africans and and then commissioning writers to proliferate the the, prop, the racist propaganda. So Zarara wrote the Chronicle of the Discovery and Conquest of Guinea. And you know, this is the first time we're seeing where you know the, the white man's coming in to save the wretched savage soul uh, of Africans. Um, and then we see this obviously being exported to the colonies to America and further down in our in our history. So let's turn now real quick about um, about children and talking about race. And you know, like I said before, I mentioned that many people sometimes are hesitant to talk about race with their children because they feel it will bring about more racism. Um, we know by many studies, and, and Professor Kang Lee is one of the um, lead, lead researchers in this, uh, that children are already showing racial bias as early as six months old. Um, they start to show you know, uh, racial bias and by associating negative and positive um, music with people from their own race and people from other races uh, with the negative. And that's actually another researcher at Harvard talks about that as the um, the other other race effect, which is you know people like to see their own race as individuals, but other races as homogenous monolithic groups. And so we see that already happening in young children. And um, this is a book, the first R: How Children Learn Race and Racism. And they say the children we observe as early as three years old, take various bits of racial and ethnic information from the surrounding world and then experiment with it and use that information in their everyday interactions with other adults and children. It is happening already. Uh, it's never too early to talk about race uh, with your children. I mean, from the time, and, and obviously that looks like age appropriate, but it should be about diversity and celebrating differences. But your children are getting those messages from the very beginning. So it's important to really make sure you step in and provide them factual information and a factual foundation. Um, another popular idea is that you know children today are so much more open. Um, and this was a really wonderful study I, I found very enlightening from Robin, oh sorry, Robin DeAngelo talks about it in White Fragility where psychologists Maria Montero, Dalila de Franza and Ricardo uh, Rodriguez studied 283 white children. And what they, and there were two groups, six and seven year olds and then nine and 10 year olds. And they asked the students, I'm sorry, the children to allocate money to a group of white and black children. And the variable was that sometimes a white adult was present and sometimes not. So what they found was that with a six to seven year old group, the, the, the children consistently discriminated against the black children. And then what they found in the nine and 10 year old group was that they only, um, only when no adult was present did they discriminate. So this finding is significant because it shows that the older children had racial, clearly had racial prejudice and acted on it, but hid it when a white adult was present. Thus, the children showed that they did not become less racially biased with age, but that they learned to hide their racism in front of adults. Um, so children are extremely adept at picking up all of our verbal and nonverbal cues, and they learn these messages from a young age. So stepping in and really making a proactive um, stance to give them proper information is critical. So let's talk for a second, as a community, us as the educators and you as the parents, what are our goals as a community in speaking about race and racism? Um, above all else, we always want to keep our children feeling safe. And yet we want to be upholding the truth as well, cultivating community and belonging while affirming every individual's identity and encouraging curiosity, wanting them to know more and ask more questions. Um, and igniting proactive racism. This might be a little redundant because I feel like anti-racism is already such a proactive thing, but I really wanted to emphasize how important that is um, in your talks with your children and how important it is at, at school um, and what we're trying to teach them uh, to be citizens of this world. Okay, so talking to your child about race and helping them develop their racial identity and racial literacy. 
the most important thing is really turning inward first. Um, it's going to be extremely hard to do this work if you haven't sat and sat with your own racial identity and explored it. Um, you know, you want to be both honest and optimistic. We have come a long way and we have a very long way to go. Uh, but there's, there is room for both in being honest and optimistic. And again, you don't want to underestimate being informed. Uh, what we tend to see, you know, especially in this last year with so many people, um, you know, waking up, if you will, to, you know, how deeply rooted racism is, how pernicious, insidious, and pervasive it is, um, you know, what you tend to see, especially in white communities, is, you know, once they've reached their, their state of wokeness, if you will, that they immediately want to spring into action. And, and this can be, even though it's well-intentioned, but this can be an extremely dangerous move if, if you bypass that period of actually becoming informed, of actually doing the research and learning. Um, so please educate, educate, educate yourself. And this is an ongoing thing um, you know, for life. There's so much to learn in our history. Uh, and obviously it's constantly evolving too in the understanding of learning and using appropriate language. You know, can you say, you know, what's the difference between race and ethnicity? Um, can I say black? Yes, you can say black. Please do use black. Um, just really staying uh, up to date and um, in your knowledge as well. So learning it and then continuing that process. And then, of course, it's really, you know, like many, many uh, turns in parenting, you know, really sitting with the fact of are these your fears and anxieties um, and are you are you passing those down? And, and trying to confront that first before any of those are then, you know, uh, handed down to your, your, your child. So what we tend to see too in talking about race and racism is um, that white parents, you know, and parents of color all have the same goal and it's, and it's to protect their kids. And, and that usually transpires in silence for white parents. Um, while parents of color, the, in order to protect their kids, it's, it's about preparedness. It's about having these talks and preparing their children. So again, going back to Ijima Oluo's quote, like this, this burden, um, you know, it, it needs to be equalized. Everybody needs to be talking about this in the same way um, to really make some, some progress. So, and again, going back, again, you don't need to be an expert, but the worst thing you could do is not talk about uh, race and racism. Um, silence really just reinforces racism and racial bias. Uh, Dr. Beverly Tatham is a very esteemed uh, researcher in, in race um, studies, and she's the author of Why Are All the Black Kids Sitting in, Together in Cafeteria? And this is from a, um, a, an article where it's, why are they all still sitting in the cafeteria together? She says, having open conversations with children about race creates opportunities to provide them with accurate information so that when they see stereotypes or hear misinformation, they have their own foundation of factual knowledge and understanding from which to draw. Shaming, shushing, or shutting down young children for asking questions about race, even if they make a comment that is inaccurate or racist, doesn't make the questions go away. It just means they go unanswered and unchecked. Um, and really a best practice approach is to probe deeper on the assumptions behind the questions and comments so that you can understand your child's thought process uh, and provide factual information and answers. And also really important, correct any misinformation. They're constantly receiving racist messages throughout the day in society, you know, through microaggressions, through media. Um, so it's really important to make sure that they are not digesting these in, in an inappropriate or inaccurate way and that you are you are there to help set them on the, the path of understanding. Um, and if you get asked a question that you're not sure how to answer, you can model that it's okay not to have all the answers. There are ways to go about attaining that information and to do it together, doing it together with your child is, is really important as well to show them. Okay, so when your children or when kids are very young, we really want to be um, focusing on, on celebrating. I mean, this is for life, but especially in the early years, celebrating our differences while recognizing similarities. Um, it's extremely natural uh, for children to notice our differences and it's important to encourage that. 
Um, this is actually from Beverly Tatum. She talks about in one of her books about how her son, she's a black woman, and her son, who's also black, came home from preschool and said, you know, mommy, am I brown because I drink chocolate milk? You know, Tommy said I, I'm brown because I drink chocolate milk which you know, she chuckled at because it's a pretty logical conclusion, if you will, for a preschool's reasoning. Um, and you know, answering these questions as factually as possible is a great way to handle this. And she talked to her son about, how, about melanin you know, and that he has darker skin because he has more melanin because his ancestors lived in places that were hotter and needed that protection. Um, and you know, explained why white people have less melanin because their ancestors moved closer to, or, you know, to, to areas where it was unnecessary and they needed to absorb their vitamin D. And so this is actually really important because the way she answered this question too is, you know, she's talking to her son and she's like, you have the most melanin in your class. And, and she talked about it because he was so proud of having the most of something in his class. And I just, I wanted to underline this specific example because when you're having these talks, especially for parents of families of color, it is, absolutely it, 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 absolutely fundamental to really instill pride and identity um, and pride in who and affirm that identity so that was a great way of the way she handled it in, in really making sure her son walked away feeling very proud about his skin and his melanin uh, content um, and so you know most parents will know that you know you don't never know what your kid's gonna say and you know she talks uh, Beverly Tatum talks about another story about um, uh, that happened not to her, but a, a different person, you know, a white family who's in the grocery store and, you know, the child says, you know, why, mommy, why is that man so dark? Or, um, you know, even worse, why is his skin dirty? And this is, this is actually going to be very hard for parents, but I, I really, as, as much as you can, as best as you can, it's really important to react in a way that does not stigmatizing the, your child's asking questions. Um, and, and that means, you know, addressing it as matter of factually, like actually baby, you know, that, that person's skin is exactly as it should be. It's, it's, it's what makes him special and, and his skin's not dirty. And, and, and going back into the factual explanation, um, but really paying a lot of attention to the way you react because your embarrassment and your fears um, send really strong messages, nonverbal message to your child. And it, it, it might make them much more afraid to approach you about this and just learn that this is not okay to talk about. So use these everyday occurrences as teachable moments. Okay. And, and when, especially when um, students and your children are young, you know, encourage noticing differences. Um, acknowledging difference is a key part of raising awareness and making sure people feel seen and that their backgrounds and lived experiences are valued. And uh, I was watching, I'll show you in a minute to this um, Amanda Gorman talk. She has a whole thing on PBS about how to talk to your children about race and racism. And she notes that noticing our differences is the first step in getting to know each other and paving the way for loving each other. So really as your child's growing up, as they have questions, and I, I please encourage that exploration of different skin tones. And I also would put some, you know, I would, I would guess that even within your own family, you know, that you have different skin tones and start to explore how they're different, how, you know, maybe yours have a few more wrinkles in them and a few more sun marks. And what does that mean? And that's what makes you special. Um, and all the time when you're having these talks about race and racism and diversity, really, really probing to understand where your child's understanding is at. You really want to be there to provide factual uh, anti-racist information. Um, and at this age, in the really young age um, group, you know, you, and you may be talking about racism, you may be talking about sexism to your five-year-old, and, and that's perfectly fine. I really actually hate um, kind of separating these into different years. I kind of try to do it to make it easier to understand, but really the main lesson is that each child is, is so unique in their development and their understanding that, you know, these, these don't necessarily are for this certain age group. It's, you know, please uh, address it individually with your child. But most children, um, they, they may not quite grasp racism at, a, you know, at four years old, but they definitely have a very strong awareness of 
fairness um, and, and what it means to be fair. And using metaphors, especially to talk about racism um, through fairness, you know, even, um, and, you know, a metaphor, for instance, if you have a son and a daughter, and, you know, you can talk about how some people are treated unfairly just because of the way they look. Um, and, you know, you can talk about, you know, if you're giving your son, you decided one night as parents to only give your son cookies um, and not the daughter. And, and these are lessons too, when you're talking about unfairness, teaching allyship right there with it. So that when you say, you know, what if we're gonna give you only cookies because you're a boy and we're not giving her any, and what, what could you do? Um, and, you know, in the sun, you can guide them down the path of saying, well, I could give her some of my cookies, you know, um, I could share my resources and my access, or um, I could talk to you guys and say, that's not fair. I could stick up for, for her, right? So these really, these lessons are already coming into play um, at a young age, and they're very possible, very much possible for children to understand and digest and setting the stage for deeper, more complex conversations. Uh, about race as they get older. And this is also really wonderful. I just wanted to take a moment. Um, Humane uh, by Angelica Das. She's a Brazilian artist, um, really celebrating all of our differences in skin tone. And, and this is what I loved about her project because she really wanted to do something, oh, excuse me, do something that moved away from these, you know, monolithic titles of white and, and black, you know? and showing the beautiful variety of so many different colors. Um, and as you'll notice too, what's wonderful is that there is no hierarchy here uh, in terms of, it's not that there's all the white people on top and, and people of color down at the bottom. You know, she really is, is fully immersed that it just breaks up any of the hierarchy uh, that unfortunately we actually see in, in society. Okay, and this is what I was talking about too. I mean, I, I put a couple of resources in here, but there's literally so many, so many for any kind of needs you have. Um, but this is a wonderful one with uh, Amanda Gorman, everyone's new favorite poet. She is remarkable. And on PBS Kids, it's a 28 minute long um, spot where she talks about how to talk to your kids about race and racism and then has families modeling it as well. So there's so many resources um, to use to help you through these, these difficult conversations. Okay, and again, I put six to nine years, but this is really just you know throughout, like being very conscious and aware and investigating what your child's sources are. Uh, what are they reading? What are they watching? Especially when they get to social media, who are they following? What kind of messages are being sent uh, about race and racism in, in those avenues. Uh, and then discussing media representations. You know, there's been so much uh, in the past five years, but in, you know, there's, there's so much in general, but especially condensed in the last four to five years of media representations of race, um, you know, with the, the, you know, the contrast in the Black Lives Matter uh, protest, uh, with the Capitol attack, with, you know, images of Kyle Rittenhouse, you know, walking free with, after you just shot people, you know, the, and these are hard things to talk about. Um, I actually put at the end uh, a book list where there, there are books also that help discuss police brutality, um, you know, these really, really complex, difficult topics to talk about with kids, but they are ready for that. They can, they can handle it. Um, it's usually us adults that have a harder time approaching it. So just know that there are plenty of resources out there. And again, if you ever have trouble finding something, please always feel free to reach out to me and I'd be happy to assist you. Um, and, and be proactive, right? Don't wait for a racist moment to happen, um, but really discuss racism proactively with your kids and discuss race, you know? And again, those conversations are easier to have when you've been discussing identity and celebrating diversity and creating that foundation of being really, really feeling good about who you are so that when you get to these harder conversations, they are easier to navigate. Um, and be very clear with your values. You know, in this family, we you know, value diversity and this is how we value it. Um, be very, very clear with your words um, and affirm children of color. So, you know, whether you're a family uh, of color or a white family, um, there is so much potential, especially in white families, talking about race and racism. You know, if you're, 
of taking this stance and perspective of talking, you know, and again, well-intentioned, but the impact could be where you're talking to your kids about race and racism and, you know, becomes about more like poor black people or poor, you know, and it becomes about the victimization and it kind of instills, it has the potential to instill this white saviorism or white superiority if it's not done well. So really, really focusing on the, the system, um, you know, and it's really important to, a lot of scholars talk about the metaphor of understanding, you know, that we all inherited this house um, and it's broken down and we need to figure, we didn't build the house, we didn't buy the house, we're in the house now and we need to, to fix it. Um, so it's really important to build that identity and affirm children of, of any race in, um, in, with, with a positive affirmation. And also on that note, representation really matters. So as you're talking about race and as you're talking about racism, it's equally important to balance that, um, that negativity uh, those hard conversations with positive representations of, of people of color. Like we don't, we don't want it to be this, you know, just sad looking at the victims. You know, we want to celebrate uh, black lives and, and all lives and all uh, people of all, I'm sorry, people of color of all, of, people of color. Um, so please make sure that your representation is balanced as well. And again, use, there's tons of books, movies, podcasts uh, to spark dialogue. Okay, so whiteness, for white families, there should be ongoing conversations about white identity and whiteness. Um, you know, what we find is that many white families do not have a developed white racial literacy. So this is, I put a couple of resources, we'll get to those in a minute as well, but it's a really important, um, this actually right here, this link is from a group called the Attaway Group where they talk about whiteness at work. Um, but they go through, you know, the characteristics. What does it mean to be? What are the characteristics of whiteness? You know, this obsession with time efficiency or punctuality, um, perfectionism, you know, understanding what makes you white. And that's also a really great way to balance so that, you know, racism isn't always talked about as, you know, it has the potential if it's not, if the other side is not talked about if white privilege and, and, and that whiteness is not discussed, then it has the very high possibility of making it seem like people of color's problem, right? That racism, which is clearly not the case at all. So it's really important as well to have those side-by-side -side conversations um, to discuss, you know, racism as a system of advantages based on race and that, you know, while one group is suffering, it's suffering at the expense or because for the other group to survive or sorry, to thrive. So making sure both of those do out, do the realities are very present and your child is very aware of them is extremely important. Um, and then, you know, discussing racial stereotypes and their harm um, that, that it was a process of dehumanization, you know, when they occur, talk about them, you know, it's easy, you know, walk into a supermarket, well, maybe not now, but when COVID, <laughs> when you can, uh, you know, walking into a supermarket and look at the, you know, magazine covers, who do you see? Like what, you know, look at, um, you know, in museums, who is, who is represented? You know, it's very easy to find many stereotypes, uh, unfortunately, to, to explain. And then as your child gets older, it is really important to explain systemic racism, you know, um, talking about these conversations, you know, where it starts with diversity and then moving into the concept of unfairness. Um, and then, you know, as they get older and, and are beginning, can understand systemic racism. Um, you know, and I've heard students say, you know, repeating racist messages sometimes that we've had to, to talk about where, you know, I've heard, a you know, students say, well, if, they, if people just work harder, you know, and, and we have to explore, you know, because it's not visible to a child. They do get messages of work hard and you can do, you know, so it's perfectly logical for them to have that understanding, but helping them see what they can't see is extremely important um, from, a, from an early age. And, and this is especially for um, white families, but instilling uh, accountability and a readiness to accept mistakes I still see, this is something we're working on, um, but I still see, you know, children do know about racism and they're able to talk about it and they may say all the right things. Um, 
I do get the sense that there is still this a little detachment, you know, and that that sometimes they think about it as oh, that's what other people do. Like I'm not racist, you know. There's the classic, America is the most racist country with no racists in it, you know. So that's a problem many of us need to confront with ourselves. Of everybody plays a role in this racist society, and what is your role, and and how is that being acted out? Um, so, and it's not about that interpersonal racism, you know, it's, uh, it's much deeper. Um, and then really emphasizing impact over intention, you know, again, going back to the, the country of, you know, the most racist country with no racists, um, because everybody has great intentions, you know, quote unquote. But that's not really where we need to be looking at. Like the impact of, of words, of actions are, is, is where the focus should be. Um, and again, operate on the assumption that it will happen. It is happening. Racism happens all the time, every day, microaggressions, racist thoughts, talk, or speech, action. And, and so don't wait to have these conversations. You want to give your child a strong foundation and understanding so that when, because they will eventually encounter a, a moment of racial stress, that they have the right knowledge and the right understanding to navigate that situation. Okay, and this is just, um, again, I'm just kind of putting in some, um, some resources. This is a really wonderful resources to, resource to explain uh, systemic racism. And there's, this is a video up here too about Ryan and Jamal and just looking at the, the differences. There's also a, a really great BBC, BBC show called The School That Tried to End Racism uh, where they do, uh, they do some inquiry into systemic racism and have students start at a, a starting line to do a race. And then, you know, if anybody's ever known what it feels like to be hungry, you know, take a step back. If anybody has had the lights but turned out on them, take a step back. You know, it's a really powerful moment. So there's, there's so much out there. Again, if you have any trouble finding anything, let me know. So I want to talk as well for a minute. Um, actually, let me skip this and then come back. Okay. I want to talk for a few overriding uh, comments to make about about just approaching topics on race and racism. Again, making sure, uh, you know, for families of color, this unfortunately, you know, it's very easy and quickly learn what whiteness means and how white supremacy operates. Um, for white families, it is important to, to name whiteness and for white people to identify as white. Uh, so not naming or claiming the word white masks whiteness, white supremacy and white privilege and power. And, um, and it really just, you know, keeps the racist, the racist status quo in place. You know, this is what white supremacy wants. They want it to not be talked about. Um, so again, that aspect, when, I, when I'm talking about racism being a system of advantages based on race, these conversations need to be balanced with not just talking about how racism affects people of color, but the other side of that, and, and that it exists for white privilege and to keep white supremacy in place. So really giving a full picture to your children about what is um, actually happening and at stake is extremely important. Um, so I also, I put a couple of uh, resources here. So Peggy McIntosh, she's, she, her article from the 80s is still quite seminal and um, where she talks about white privilege. I, I've had so many conversations with adults. Uh, white, white adults especially have, tend to have a hard time sometimes accepting or recognizing privilege. And, and what we mean by privilege is not that you, you know, haven't struggled or that you haven't worked hard for what you have, but it simply means that you've never had a setback because of your race. Um, if anything, you've had advances because of your race. So understanding what that looks like is, is really important. Um, and Leila Said, uh, Me and White Supremacy is also a really wonderful, it's a, it's a workbook that you work through to kind of understand uh, whiteness better. And of course, Robin D'Angelo, um, White Fragility and her book on developing white racial literacy, What Does It Mean to Be White? Melina, uh, just real quick, we had a request um, for the BBC link also, as well as a systemic racism, racism video uh, location when you have a chance. Okay, sounds good. I can pop those into the thing later. 
Um, okay, so again, ongoing discussions on white privilege. So the same way, you know, for families of color that are having conversations that have to have, you know, the talk about how to, um, how to, you know, how to, how to handle themselves when, you know, interacting with police, you know, the, the, the same kind of, the, the talks need to happen because white families are not talking about white privilege and, and white supremacy. And that is the other part of this that needs to happen. Um, so in both of those conversations, you know, as, as difficult and heartbreaking as it is for a family of color um, to have to tell their kid that not everyone in society sees them as a human and not everyone's going to treat them that way, um, you know, clearly that is, leaves a lot of room for, um, you know, self-loathing and self-hate to come through. And when we do see that in a lot of communities of color, right, like struggling with that identity. Um, and then in, in the white communities, when, when children do find out about uh, white privilege and, and white supremacy, there's also guilt on that side. And that, that guilt is normal. Again, the idea and the hope is that the foundation of pride in one's identity has been so solidly put in place that these conversations can move from um, beyond taking it personally, even though it's very difficult, but move beyond that and for children to understand this as a, a societal problem. Um, but especially, you know, for white families, when you're talking to your children, um, and if they do experience feelings of guilt at learning about their privilege just because of the way they look, a great way to deal with that right away is to, to channel that guilt into anti-racist action. And I actually put this book, this book is anti-racist. Um, this is one we've been using um, in, in our classrooms as well. Um, just really wonderful ideas for students to take action. Um, and, and that really helps you know, everyone's identity when we feel like we're all working towards uh, dismantling racism and eliminating this problem. Not gonna happen in our lifetime, but it feels good to making, making our progress. Um, and I do encourage you down the line to, these are just some samples of Peggy McIntosh's. As your children get older, definitely, um, you know, I'll be looking at this with my seventh graders. We just, we just began our uh, racial literacy curriculum, but understanding white privilege, these are some of Peggy McIntosh's um, examples of what it actually means to be uh, white and privileged. So I, I do suggest you reading that and going through that with your kids as they get older, because it, I think they have a, you know, it, 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 they definitely have a very, um, you know, aha moment when they start to understand really what, we're, what we mean by white privilege. Um, okay, and just overall, some com comments I want to make that, you know, to when you have these talks um, and in your households to really avoid popular harmful narratives. Um, so, you know, colorblindness, you know, before, before the civil rights movement, it was socially acceptable to state, you know, that for a white person to state that they are superior or feel superior. Um, and then, you know, with the civil rights movement and, and basically seeing the images on television, um, what happened was there was this moment, you know, seeing, you know, hoses, um, dogs sicked on, on people of color. And, and at that moment, um, you know, it gave people a very strong image of like, that's what a racist is, you know, a KKK person or, you know, these, these white uh, racists. And, and that and it's actually become very harmful because we, we've separated um, what, what it means. It's just such a simplistic view of racism. Um, and then also we were taught to believe in colorblindness, right? Colorblindness became a very big thing after the civil rights movement and that it does not work, right? We have to acknowledge our differences um, to, in order to understand each other, in order to begin to love each other, right? That celebration of diversity is, is really important. Um, and, you know, Robin D'Angelo loves to talk about this. I was taught to treat everyone the same and that's just not true, right? We all have prejudices. We all have biases. It's it's how you act on them or, or avoid them more more so. It was what's important. Um, and then you know, color celebrate is actually what a uh, more common. I mean, you see it more commonly by white progressives, uh, where you know, it shows a very strong lack of of racism. You know, so when people say oh yeah, well, I used to live in New York or I've been to Costa Rica or my brother-in-law's black, you know, and, and just understanding that like 
you know, people use so many phrases like that to try to convince you of that they're not racist, you know? So uh, really just being aware of how these conversations are being had at home um, is, is important. So you wanna avoid these. This is another one, and this is kind of goes back to what I was talking about. Um, this is with, with accountability because unfortunately we are some very simplistic view of racism has led to this good bad binary that if you're racist you're bad and it means you're ignorant bigoted prejudiced mean-spirited old from the south um and if you're not racist that's good and you know and progressive educated open-minded well-intentioned young northern and this is really so problematic because and this is what i was talking about helping your children preparing them for the fact that they probably will do something racist, that they might say something racist and, and not making it um, come down to like, you are a bad person, you know, like getting outside of this binary. Because what we see happening is there's so much defensiveness, um, you know, be call being called a racist is just the worst thing, like the worst thing. And, and so, because we, we immediately associate that you're saying I'm a bad person, you're saying I'm an immoral person, I'm ignorant, bigoted. So, so much time is wasted in those moments with fighting the notion that you think I'm racist and you're saying I'm a bad person, when you know that energy really needs to be shifted and used towards understanding where the racism happened and dismantling it. So really being aware of how to you know, and we're, we talk about this a lot uh, in my classroom, but that that this needs to be something that we can all be a little more ready to hear um, and doesn't make it easier, but except because again, this is, you know, again, one of the most racist countries with no racists in it. So how is that happening? Like no one's admitting it, no one is accepting the fact that perhaps I had a part in this as well. So really as a society, we really need to move past this good bad binary in order to get the work done um and then also you know how how are you supporting your child's racial literacy like again going back to those messages the nonverbal messages I, look at your world like how diverse is your universe are, are all your friends white are you know what kind of television are you what kind of books are you like what kind of pictures do you have in the house um, your your children notice these things very much and even if you're not making explicit comments, they're receiving messages that they don't need diversity, potentially, that it doesn't add anything to their life. Um, so being very aware of your own uh, circle and the way you are, you know, who you interact with and whatnot. Um, and modeling intercultural relationships. And, and this is hard. I don't mean just, you know, it's hard to make friendships in, in general. Um, but, you know, there, there are definitely ways, you know, and the same way exposure to other cultures and races. So if, you're, if your neighborhood's not as racially diverse as you want, if your school's not as racially diverse as you want, you know, finding ways to have your child join a team or sport or a hobby, you know, to expose to other cultures and races and, and talk about it, go to museums, visit, but, you know, really bringing that exposure. Um, I have actually one friend whose family, she, they, by the time she got to college, she, um, she like one day there it was a it was a Jewish holiday they were celebrating and the people she was like she started talking all about it and and her friends were like oh well I didn't know I didn't know you're Jewish and she's like no I'm not um, but you know I guess in her family they celebrated every every holiday because the, the mother wanted her to be exposed to how other cultures uh, are are celebrating so there there are many ways to get that exposure even if you don't have you know. The, the diversity in your life that maybe you're seeking right now, but there are ways to, to get that. Um, and another thing is, you know, modeling anti-racist behavior and being intentional about your anti-racism. Uh, because, you know, be intentional about seeking out, valuing, and supporting creators, authors, colleagues, neighbors, professionals, and educators of color. Uh, you can tell your kids, again, you know, Black Lives Matter and, and put a sign in your door, but you know, if you're not really showing your children how Black Lives Matter and all people of color's lives matter to you, um, that they're going to pick up on that. They're, they're going to get that message pretty loud and clear. And one thing I did want to talk about is um, 
calling in instead of calling out. We talk about this actually a lot because again, going back to the notion of being, um, there being so much defensiveness and the worst thing in the world is being called a racist. So, you know, really modeling that for your kids and even with your kids, you know, like if they say something, you know, finding a way to call people into the conversation instead of alienating them through um, shaming them, essentially. Okay. Okay, I wanted to, actually, I'm gonna go back to the other slide. I wasn't sure if I'd have enough time, but I want to discuss this real quick. So this is a, a mindful strategy for, for, for everybody, um, specifically when you are encounters of, you're managing encounters of racial stress. So um, this is from Howard Stevenson, who's a clinical psychologist and professor at the at University of Pennsylvania. And he says, uh, we teach kids especially how to use a mindfulness approach we call calculate, locate, communicate, breathe, and exhale. So when you have these racial encounters, um, calculate what feelings are you having? And then on a scale of one to 10, how intense are they? So somebody could be called a slur or say something they regret and they feel scared at the level of nine. And they're also angry at themselves at the level of six but they're also sad because the person they said it to might have been somebody that they like and care about. All of those feelings are important. So locating it is means to what degree can you locate these feelings in your body? And because the body kind of keeps the score of your emotions, if you can figure that out, you're more likely to be able to relax the part of your body, which will keep you from more anxiety. And communicate. So this is um, in terms of communicate, what he's talking about is, you know, what self-talk are you noticing? Are you saying anything to yourself? Like, man, that was an idiot thing to say. Oh my gosh, they think they're going to think I'm a racist. Or what images come to your mind? Do you see any pictures of people or situations while you're going through the encounter? We can teach people those strategies followed by breathing and exhaling. And we know that it helps many people bring their brain from sort of locking down to being much more open to seeing around themselves, to hearing better, to listening better. And that's where the healthy decision-making comes in. The opposite of that is that people are overwhelmed so much that they try to avoid a racial moment. And, they, and if they are able to avoid it, the stress will go down, but they're not any more competent for the next time they need to speak up or have a conversation. So this is really a useful mindfulness strategy for everybody, whether you're on the receiving or the, a, the acting end of you know, any kind of racial uh, encounter. And then I also wanted to, hopefully you all were able to see um, our, this is our curriculum. Uh, we, we held a, a, a meeting, a, a night of conversation around it back in December, but I also wanted to put this out here. So in case you are having deeper questions about age appropriate um, conversations about race, that this is the flow of our curriculum. And I went ahead and color coded them because these first three are really about identity. Uh, and like I talked about with diversity, you know, identity looking inward and then identity looking at yourself as a part of the community and where you fit into the world around you. Uh, and then, excuse me, third, fourth and fifth grade, excuse me, does get more, uh, it goes much more historical, looking at stories of activism, um, slavery is introduced, looking at how geography uh, gave certain civilizations a head start, looking at immigration. And then by the time they're in sixth grade, we're having really um, quite deep conversations about the historical construction of race, uh, media misrepresentation and pseudoscientific uh, racism and in eighth grade specifically, the institution of racism and combating systemic inequality. And there's also a parent guardian companion guide that I believe was sent out, but I can also ask Joel to send it to all families. So this is the accompanying, uh, accompanying guide for the Pollyanna, Pollyanna racial literacy curriculum. So this could also serve as a really wonderful resource as you are accompanying you know, on this journey with your child as they develop their racial literacy and hopefully you do as well. So, okay, I think, I think that's it. Let me pull up those resources of doing stuff.
and, and please feel free to ask questions. I know we don't have a lot of time left. Uh, thank you yeah. so much, Melina, yeah, for sure. doing such a great job um, as always. And, and we always learn so much from these presentations. Um, so parents, you can put questions in the chat or send them privately if you don't want them to be public or just speak up. And thank you yeah. for being here tonight. Okay, sorry, it took my tech skills a minute to get back to the screen. Yeah, any questions? I know, I hope that was helpful. Um, I hope, you know, that kind of gave some clarity on certain topics. Um, yeah, See, the Andrea, yes. Go for this it. is great. Thank you so much for hosting it. So important to keep this conversation going and going. Um, I am wondering, in San Francisco, in addition to a lot of this, I find the nuance around, um, like, the cancel culture and political cor political correctness. Like if we move out of the Bay Area, there's that fine line of like our kids almost going into the other direction. Um, and so just how to balance that. Um, I'm less worried about that obviously than um, systemic racism and, and unconscious bias. But I'm curious if you could speak to that sort of cancellation culture and this idea of, um, it's sort of like your idea of um, calling in instead of calling out. So yeah. that in addition to um, one other question. Oh, and then also the intersectionality of, of um, economic disadvantage. So, you know, we're seeing in our country a lot of poor white people reacting in, in racist ways and they're upset about their, their situation and and I just, I, I'm not to excuse that behavior, but just try to create intersectionality between race and economic sort of station in life. Yeah. So I'll go ahead um, for the first one. We talked actually, we had a lot of rich conversations about this um, around election time, kind of that council culture. Uh, and talking, you know, a lot of the conversation was talking about um, our First Amendment rights too, you know, and how do we, where, where do, where's the line? Is there a line? You know, if, if everybody has the right to their freedom of speech, then why can't the Proud Boys say what they're gonna say? Why can't, you know, the, why don't they have space where they can hold, you know, and, and speak freely? And so we talk a lot about this actually in, in our class um, because what we, what we talked about was basically trying to establish where that line is and when, when that speech, when those actions you know, when we traced how those words and actions, you know, the same thing that's going on in the impeachment trial, you know, how those actions and words lead to death, you know, that lead not just to violence, but death of people. So like understanding um, where that line is, is very difficult, I think, you know, in terms of the, the council culture, but uh, that's, the, that's the delineation we drew in the classroom. Um, and it's actually even celebrating the, um, the Holocaust Remembrance Day, you know, doing some like side by side studies. So how is it that we experienced on the world scale Nazi Germany and now throughout Europe, you know, you can't, you know, can't, can't put a swastika anywhere. You can't, you know, if you, if you say Arbat Makri, you know, if you have any kind of, any kind of propaganda talk along those lines, it's illegal, you know? And then looking at the US and what, how did we have a civil war and the South lost and slavery was abolished, but everything was allowed to continue? How did slavery actually never go away and that the black codes were introduced and how, you know? So also doing like these side-by-side -side comparisons and did that make sense? Because are we not in the same situation? You know, like, are we not, you know, are we, how far have we come from the Civil War it, with everything that's happened in these last five years? So I really, you know, we talk about in the classroom kind of presenting, you know, as an inquiry based, you know, not not telling the students what to think, but presenting the facts to them and letting them draw their, you know, which way do you think makes more sense? Should it be outlined? Should that hate speech be outlined? You know, how should that work? And how has that been working in Europe? Um, so it's really, you know, we, we definitely take that stance of trying to just, you know, at school specifically provide a lot of facts and information and, and letting the students draw their um, conclusion. I'm sorry, Andrew, I can't remember the second part. <laughs> yeah, I just threw a huge two 
Oh, yeah, questions. Uh, that was very helpful. Thank you. Uh, very specific and and very useful for both adults and kids. So thank you. Um, and then I was just wondering about the economic um, sort of component of things, and you know how we how we um, support people of all races who are 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 struggling economically. Yeah. That, I mean, that's a very tough one. I, I wish I had more answers for you on that one. I think, you know, we've been talking about, um, I think an interesting note I have to say on, on that from the economic is we, we just started, like literally today, just started our, our unit on what is race, uh, how science, society, and media misrepresent race. And so, and I just, you know, that we started with that question as like, what is race, you know? And I'm just waiting for them because anyone who's actually sat with that question knows that it's extremely complicated. And then, well, that doesn't make sense, you know, because it, in fact, because it is a social construct. So it's not based on any kind of, you know, fact, if you will. So, and then looking at um, with people trying to racially identify, then how is it that you see certain people who are not white but associate as white because of their economic status. And so like those, those kind of that, those levels of intersectionality and how you do get access to being white, if you will, the richer you are. And, and really trying to talk about that in, in how we see that play out in society. Um, that's been a really interesting spark of conversation thus far. Um, you know, at our school, and this is actually separate from the Pollyanna curriculum, but in our fifth grade unit, we have a, a unit on the distribution of wealth. And that's usually a very eye-opening experience for our students, um, especially as many of them, not everyone, but many of them start to come into an understanding of their own privilege and, and how do we use that. Um, and, you know, and that part of what we do at La Scuola, too, is always having this emphasis on action. You know, we learn about these things, but not as passive, you know, receivers of information. But how are we going to take this knowledge and go do something? You know, so we just had our a climate change unit and, you know, the students, they're going to make a PSA. We're going to write this letter. You know, that's coming after the break. But, you know, really a call to action of what can we do? Um, so, I mean, it's hard to tackle the socioeconomic uh aspect of that because it takes so much of the institutional knowledge, uh, you know, really understanding it at that level. Um, I, you know, I, I said the other day, I was like, I think we need a DEI person at the federal level. Like if we had a DEI, we would have no homeless, like we need someone that just that cares about people, you know, I was like, that's not what we actually need. So maybe we'll write some letters to Congress on that one too. <laughs> I, I actually have some information on that if you want to reach out to me separately. There's oh, some yeah. movement on that front. Really? Okay. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah, I will. I'll connect with you. Thanks so much, Andrea. Thank you for your answers and sorry to keep everyone late. Oh, <laughs> or you could okay. go on your own accord, I'm sure. No, that's totally fine. No, that um, was a great question. So thank you so much for asking. And if anybody has to go, please, you know, feel free to go. But we're here if you have more questions. You can keep going, Andrea. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, let me try to, so the, the, I really, really, really love this, um, the, the school that tried to end racism. So it's a high school and it's again, in the, it's in England it's from the BBC. Let me just find it real quick. School that tried to end. I think it's like a three or four episodes, but um, you know, it, it's fascinating too watching these kids come into their knowledge about how their biases work. You know, I think that really threw them for the loop because they did, um, I don't know if any of you have had the chance to do it, but Project Implicit through Harvard has a, a numerous different kind of uh, biases uh, where you can test yourself. And, and so the, the, the students took it and I think they were just shocked, you know, and, and then separate, separated them out in affinity groups. Um, and then as they're learning about race and racism and biases, um, watching their conversations with their parents, you know, who some of their parents are African nationals, you know, and so, or, you know, from different countries in Africa. So, and, and seeing the lack of knowledge, um, you know, that a mother is defending the shop owner who watches her son when he comes to like, well, somebody probably, you know, and that's that internalized racism, you know, it, it's, it's just a really, really fascinating show. Um, I'm going to find, it's on YouTube. You can find, I mean, they uploaded it on YouTube. Let's see. And then what was the other uh, resource someone was asking about? Did the BBC, they asked about the BBC and 
another one. Um, and the systemic racism video. Yeah, Sorry. yeah. I also wanted to recommend, uh, this was recommending the DI committee as well, um, a podcast from the New York Times, I'm going to put in the chat, called uh, Nice White Parents. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's, it's super uh, interesting if you haven't uh, listened to it. I mean, it's, it's set in Brooklyn, so it's a slightly different uh, environment than San Francisco, but, but still very, very relevant. Um, and I think it's truly informative and, and um, really spot on.